What's up everyone, it's Karthik with MoneyVest. So in this video, we are going to be talking about the S&P 500's entire valuation and fundamental analysis on the S&P 500. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be taking a look at this entire spreadsheet. And uh, again, this is a lot of data going back as far as 1960s so that you can have a much better understanding and idea of how well or how poorly the S&P 500 has done relative to its earnings growth. So the reason why earnings are so important is because at the end of the day, whatever we hear in the news, in the media related to Japan, related to the US markets, related to all the recessions, crises, everything boils down to the bottom line. I think it's very, very fair to say that if earnings are strong, markets are strong. If earnings start to deteriorate, markets also foresee that Essentially, markets are forward looking, so they try to anticipate what the earnings are going to be in the coming quarters, and they already price that information in and they start going down. So, if there's any type of crisis, if there's any type of uncertainty, people expect that earnings are going to take a hit, and as a result, stock market starts to come down. Because there was a very interesting question during our live stream, and uh, that question was related to the price to earnings multiple, the PE multiple, and uh, it's probably one of the most basic and a uh, very, very important and most quoted metric for when it comes to S&P 500's overall valuation and also for any other stock per se. So I've done a lot of research, spent a lot of hours compiling all this data for you, going back as far as 1960s. So we're going back well over 67, uh, actually 64 years to better understand the overall performance for the market as well as the earnings. So hope you all enjoy it. All I'm asking is that you drop a like and share this video with another investor, trader, friend or family. It's really recommendations like you guys sharing these videos, putting it on uh, Discord channels and WhatsApp groups and whatnot that helps us grow uh, this community. And uh, again, I'm doing a lot of hours here uh, putting together these spreadsheets. So I would really uh, appreciate that referrals and that word of mouth. So coming back over to 1960s, S&P back then was trading at just over 58 and it has, of course, increased to now well over 5,292. So this is where we are currently trading. Of course, as of the time that you're watching this video, that number is going to change. Right now, we're at 5,288. So if I update that number very quickly, 5,288, that's where we are at the moment. So far, up a little bit over 10%, almost 11% from the close of 2023. 2023, we saw the markets up a little bit over 24%. And in 2022, we saw the markets decline by almost uh, 20% because that was the bear market of 2022. Now, one of the things that I've highlighted here is that most often than not, what you will see is the negative performance on the S&P 500 can very much be correlated to the earnings decline. So what I mean by that is that 1966, and of course, don't get me wrong, there were other um, situations and other circumstances back then. So I'm not saying that just because of the earnings coming down, the S&P 500 sold off. But the idea here is to draw a conclusion from how the markets performed and how did the earnings do in that particular year or in the years to follow. So I'm sure there were other reasons. You know, we've had great inflation. We've had the oil crisis. We've had a lot of different catalysts that have resulted in the markets having that level of uncertainty and then selling off. But that uncertainty really boils down to one metric, and that is the bottom line for companies, right? How much profit can these companies generate, which is the 500 companies within the S&P 500 during times of crisis? So if you take a look at 1966, and, and really just our focus is going to be everything that is in yellow. And what you'll notice is that when the markets actually do drop, so for example, 1966, we saw a drop of over 13%. The earnings per share for the S&P 500 back then, $5.41, trading at just under 15 times earnings, earnings multiple. Uh, the earnings actually grew by 2%. But the next year, in 1967, we actually saw a drop of almost 1% in earnings per share. If you take a look at 1969, 11% drawdown in the S&P 500 to entire year, to close out the entire year. That particular year, the markets were uh, the earnings were higher, 6.6%, but the following year, earnings declined by almost 10%. Same thing happened in 1973, 1974, 1975. The markets were down. Again, during great inflation, we did see a significant drawdown in the S&P 500. Uh, both of those years, the earnings actually grew, but then dropped over 17.5% in 
in 1975 when the markets actually did rally over 31%. 1977 was a little bit of an anomaly. Markets did decline over 11.5%, yet the uh, earnings grew by over 11 and 7% respectively in 1977 and 78. If you come over to 1981, markets down almost 10%. The following years, we saw a decline of almost 9 to as much as 4% in 1982 and 1983. Uh, if you come take a look at 1990, once again, markets seeing a negative year down over six and a half percent earnings were down almost seven to as much as 14 percent in the next two years come down a little bit further 2000s the dot-com bubble we saw significant correction and of course even the bear market for s p 500 nasdaq was in a crash s p 500 was in a brutal bear market down almost 50 percent from all-time highs a 30 percent decline in earnings in 2001 and then 07 08 again you can see the markets coming down and earnings were down anywhere between six to as much as over 40 percent during the peak of the great financial crisis so what you'll notice is that most of these stock market declines can very well be correlated to earnings declines earnings actually coming down with a few anomalies here and there because for example 1986 Markets were higher, despite seeing almost an 8% decline in earnings per share. 1977, markets were down, despite seeing an earnings growth. And then if you come over to 2022, which was the most recent market pullback or a bear market, markets were down almost 20% despite seeing the earnings actually climb higher 7.5%. And for those reasons, we were able to recover fairly well. In 2020, because of the pandemic, we did see earnings decline over 14% because the Federal Reserve once again, um, you know, stepped in to lower interest rates fairly quickly. And so the markets were higher 16%, but the earnings did actually take a hit. So economic situation was much worse than what the market was suggesting us to be because the Federal Reserve stepped in fairly quickly to lower interest rates. So the only key takeaway that I really want you to have from this is that earnings and S&P 500's performance do move in tandem to each other. Sometimes one is um, a little bit ahead of the other. Uh, more, more likely, the markets are going to be forward looking. So they are somewhat ahead in their understanding and anticipation of where the earnings are going to be. It, of course, it's not pre picture perfect because markets are not perfect. Um, you know, sometimes the market gets it wrong. So the markets would decline, even though earnings will grow that particular year. And sometimes the markets will go up despite having earnings declines. Um, but so it's not perfect, but there is a significant correlation between how the earnings do in that particular year or in the years to follow with the S&P 500's performance. Now, this right here is a column for all the price to earnings multiple historically. And these are all the numbers. Um, and if I were to simply plot this on a chart, so if I essentially you know, look at all the years and plot uh, for both the earnings, per sh uh, the price to earnings and exactly the years, uh, you'll get a chart that something looks something like this. And again, I'm sure you've seen this chart in many places. Uh, essentially, what it shows you is the overall price to earnings multiple for uh, S&P 500. And uh, what you'll notice is, of course, that we have seen a bit of an increase in the overall price to earnings multiples, right? Historically, we have traded as low as here. Let me just change the chart a little bit. So it looks somewhat better. And I'm going to remove for a lot of these values. Let me just go that, go do that. And boom, there we go. So, okay. So if you take a look at the price earnings multiple chart, and you'll notice historically, we've kind of averaged around 18 to 20, uh, dropped down in the 1970s. Uh, and these were much lower at under 10. And then of course, had a very nice steady increase, uh, peak of 2000 during the dot-com bubble, then the bubble bursting coming down. Uh, then of course, having a crash in 2008 as well. And then of course, exploded during times of 2020. 2021, uh, because of so much quantitative easing, almost came back to the same levels from back in the dot-com bubble here, and then coming back down and now a little bit more stable. And this is where we currently are. So 2024 earnings per share expectations are for $245 collectively for all the 503 S&P 500 companies. And because the markets are at 5288, so it's simply a division. So you take the actual S&P 500 value divided by the earnings per share expectations, and we arrive at 21.5 for S&P 500's current valuation. Now, you might be wondering, uh, you know, is that is that fair? Is that undervalued, expensive, cheap? What is the current true valuation for S&P 500 and how does it compare against historical averages? So that's what we're going to go over now. And before I move further, I just want to also address that if you don't believe me that the S&P 500 is very much dependent on its earnings per share, then take a look at this. You'll notice that we have seen a 7% increase compounded annual growth rate in earnings over the last 64 years, the earnings have grown by over 7% per year. And the S&P 500 has also returned just over 7% in actual index value. Although we can increase this number to 2024. Uh, so we'll have to just update this cell E68 uh, to E69. 
So that's going to be that number. And then, of course, we'll update the D68 to D69 as well. And then hit enter. 7.3% uh, is that number is what we have. And we can also update this number. So we'll just put 69 here and we'll put 69 over here as well. 69 is the number. Uh, so 7 and 7.3%. So they're very much uh, on par with each other um, with S&P 500's performance. This is not including for dividends, by the way. So if you include for dividends, of course, you'll see that performance be well over 8, 9%. Uh, but including, not including for dividends, just simply a price return with the earnings per share growth. We've seen a very much similar uh, number. Now, if you come take a look at the 67, 64 year, I keep saying 67, 64 year average, median, minimum and maximum values. Um, on average, S&P 500 has traded at just under 17 to a little bit over 17 earnings multiple. Uh, that's the average and the median value respectively with the least value at 7.3. That I believe was during the uh, 1960s or might be 1970s. So if you come back here, and if you look for the 7.3, uh, that was 1974. Uh, and that's when the markets you know, dropped almost 30%. And we actually did witness a 17.5% earnings drop as well. Um, so, so really what happened here is uh, the reason why we saw a valuation multiple of 7.3 is because the markets were down almost 30%. So you've got the price, which is the P at the top, coming down and the earnings growing at over 17% right? That particular year. So earnings were going up, price was coming down, and the valuation multiple just absolutely collapsed to 7.33. And the highest multiple we've seen, I think it's just under 29, or just a little bit under 30. So you can see that that number is going to be over there back in 2001. And a lot of people may find that strange that 2001, like that, that was like right in the middle of a crash. Well, how come, how can we have markets that was very, very overvalued at 29? Well, that's the whole point, right? Markets were at an extreme overvaluation. That's why we saw the crash in the first place, because that was a bubble bursting um, for the NASDAQ, for tech stocks, and the S&P 500, of course, came down with it. Uh, so despite a 13% drop, we had a much significant, more severe drop in earnings per share of over 30%. So that's the denominator. That's the E in the price to earnings multiple uh, going down faster than the price. And as a result, the valuation multiple jumped. So you really have to understand that you've got two components when it comes to price to earnings multiple. You've got the price and you've got the earnings. If the price is actually moving up, okay? So if I say up here and the earnings are constant, right? So the price to earnings multiple in this example is actually going to go up. If we have price price going down and earnings going uh, earnings staying constant, price to earnings is actually going to go down. Okay? Now, if we have price staying constant and earnings going up, then price to earnings multiple is actually going to come down. And if we have the price staying constant and the earnings going down, so price is stable, earnings are going down, then the price to earnings multiple is actually going to go up. Now, there are more scenarios that you can draw from this. So in, in other words, if price is going up and earnings are going up, so price is going up, earnings are going up, then you have to look at the delta, which is the difference between those two, to better understand whether the price to earnings multiple goes up or down, because if the price is going up faster than the earnings, then the price to earnings multiple is actually going to go up. But if earnings are going up faster, then the price, then it's possible that that multiple comes down. And what we really witnessed back um, in the 19, in, in 2000s was that the price was going down, but earnings were going down faster. And as a result, that earnings multiple increased to almost 30. Hope that makes sense. It is a little bit more of an understanding of uh, just the, the, the magnitude of these changes for these ratios uh, so that you can get a better understanding of, you know, what happens to the valuation of multiple. Because at the end of the day, like really it's the valuation of the S&P 500 that determines, uh, you know, whether there's going to be buyers stepping in or not. Uh, and, and same thing is true for, you know, when they're going down, they're both going down. So uh, you'll notice that uh, price is going down, earnings are going down, and again, we're dependent on the magnitude of that sell-off. If earnings are going down faster than the price, then the price or earnings multiple can actually go up in that case, which we noticed uh, back in 2001. Um, so let me just show you very quickly, and uh, I hope this is going to work. So if we actually see um, the 2001 price going down by 13%, and let's just say that earnings did not drop by 30%, they only dropped by a little bit. So let's just say earnings per share were $50 and we actually only saw an 11% drop in the earnings and not a 30% drop. Take a look at what happens to the earnings multiple. It comes down significantly, right? So that's high from 29.5 down to 22.96, right? 
right? It comes down because they're both going down, obviously, but the earnings per share is going down less than the drawdown in the S&P 500. So as a result, uh, we we see the price earnings multiple still pretty stable at 22, 23. Um, so so that's that's a that's a quick explanation on price earnings. Um, and uh, let's just move forward here. So take a look at the historical averages. So we got the five year, the 10 year, 20 year, and 30 year averages for uh, the earnings multiple on the S&P 500. If you've got the average, the median, and the difference between the historical average with where we are at the moment. Now, based on this, uh, you'll notice that we only are overvalued based on a 20 and a 30 year average and median. Uh, on a 10 year basis, we are quite fairly valued uh, because a 21.5 multiple uh, is, you know, on, on a 10 year basis, you'll notice that we've traded at 20.5 and 20.7 on an average and a median basis. So we might be four and a half to 4% expensive compared to our 10-year averages. On a five-year basis, we are cheap. Uh, we are cheap to somewhat fair, um, you know, based on the 21.6 to 21.3. That's been the five-year average and median. But certainly on a 20 and a 30-year basis, uh, we are expensive on this uh, in the markets right now. Uh, at the moment, just by about eight to as much as 17%. So, uh, so again, historically speaking, we've traded on a 30 and a 20-year basis around 18 to 19 times P multiple. And we're just about 21.5. So that is, again, an 8 to as much as 17% um, increase or, or overvaluation compared to what the averages are. So it really just depends on how you look at the market, uh, what historical averages you really look at to better understand whether the markets are expensive, cheap, or fairly trading. Uh, this right here is going to be the percentiles. So what you'll notice is the 95th percentile is 27 and a half or higher. The two percentile is 7.3 and lower. Uh, and right now we're at the 87.5 percentile. Actually, I need to update this. Uh, anything that's over going to be 21 is actually going to be expensive. Anything under 18 is going to be cheap. Um, and, and somewhere between 18 and 21 is going to be fair. Um, so right now 21.5 and we are in the 87.5 percentile, which makes us expensive at the moment, even after the nine to ten percent, uh, you know, almost a, almost a ten percent correction that we witnessed um, in the last few days. But twenty one point five is where we are, eighty seven point five percentile, and that puts us still, I would say, in the expensive sort of zone um, at the moment for the S and P five hundred. Anything we drop below twenty, it's going to put us in the seventy fifth percentile. Uh, the median value, of course, being seventeen point three, so that's going to be the fiftieth percentile for. Um, for S&P 500's valuation. That's going to be the median 17.3. That's the middle value. That's the 50th percentile, as you can see over here. So let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Um, and, you know, from, from based, of, based off of this analysis, I would still consider the S&P 500 on an aggregate basis uh, still slightly, slightly above its historical averages, uh, although it has come down. I mean, so, if, you know, if just to give you a perspective, uh, if we come over to where we were versus where we are. So if you take a look at S&P 500's all-time high. Let me just plug that value in. We were, for S&P 500, uh, the all-time high sitting at 5669. So if I plug that number in, so just to give you a bit of a context here, if you were trading at all-time highs at 5669, we would have been at over 23 times earnings multiple, and that would have put us at over 92 percentile for S&P 500. So 92 percentile is where we would have been had we been at all-time highs uh, at over 23 times earnings multiple based on $245 of earnings per share for this year. So we would certainly be uh, expensive at that at that level and trading uh, well above all of our historical averages, anywhere between uh, 6% to as much as 22% overvalued um, compared to our five year to as much as 20 to 30 year averages on a historical basis. So the fact that we have come down uh, has really just brought us back down to a more reasonable, more, um, uh, you know, more f uh, fair, I would say, but sl still slightly on the higher side um, as compared to historical measures. So hope you all enjoyed this video and a complete update on S&P 500's valuation. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And uh, as always, happy investing. I'll see you all in the next video.